When I pulled up to my mother's home, everything looked exactly the same. I hadn't been here in years, but the rose bushes and blue painted walls instantly brought me back to my childhood. This was a quaint two-story home in rural Ohio. There was absolutely nothing exceptional about it. Nothing except the fond memories and the spark of nostalgia that lit inside me. I parked my car and walked up to the porch. Before I knocked, I took a long, deep breath. I silently prayed that everything was going to be okay. All my life, I'd been close with my mom. Even after I'd moved halfway across the country and gotten too busy to make our once daily phone calls. We drifted apart, but we still always had each other, at least until about six months ago. That was when mom had told me she joined a new church. Around that time, she'd stopped calling completely and would respond to my texts after days or even weeks after I sent them. That was why I decided to visit her. I told her I planned to stop by this week, but she never got back to me. I came anyway, taking off work and flying all the way from California. I knocked on the front door, and my mom didn't answer. Her car was still in the driveway, so she would still be home. I tried again, nothing. I took out my keys and tried the old house key that I hadn't used in years. It worked. And soon, I let myself in. Like the outside, the inside looked exactly the same. The furniture was unchanged. The family photos on the walls were all the same. The only different thing were a couple of new paintings, one on each wall. There was some sort of abstract art with red, scratchy lines that formed some sort of symbols. I didn't like those at all. I'd come all this way, and I couldn't leave now. Even if Mom wasn't home, I figured I could wait for her to come back. After all, she knew I was coming. I got a strange feeling that something was off. I wasn't particularly scared, though. All the house lights were on, and nothing seemed disturbed. I called for my mom again, my voice echoing against the empty walls. No answer but I thought I heard a rustling upstairs. I slowly walked up the steps, the wood creaking under my feet. This was my childhood home, the place where I'd felt nothing but comfort and warmth as a child. Now it felt cold. As I checked each room, I saw that the bathroom was empty, and the closets, and the bedroom, though the bed was still unmade and a half-unfinished glass of water sat on the end table. After careful inspection, I realized that yes, I was alone. Instantly, my fear ebbed. Everything was fine. Mom wasn't here right now, but it didn't seem like she was in any danger. There weren't any signs of a struggle. The house was the same as always, except for the new weird symbols on the walls. I would figured I'd relax and wait for her to get back. I could treat this as a home alone day, like when I was a kid. I'd curl up in front of the TV with a bowl of cereal and watch some scary movie that Mom wouldn't have wanted me to see. It would have been nice. It'd be nostalgic. My heart slowing back to normal, I headed back to the kitchen. I opened the cupboard and realized that she didn't have cereal. She didn't have any food at all. The entire kitchen was filled with homemade, labelless jars. Maybe Mom had taken up a new hobby? But these weren't pickles or jams. The jars had strange hunks of meat. Organs? Animal organs? I reflexively gagged. Some of the jars weren't closed all the way, and the whole kitchen had an awful stench. Something strange was happening. I couldn't deny it anymore. I needed to figure out what was going on, so I pulled out my phone and called my mom's cell. After a moment of silence, I heard a single ring coming from upstairs. It was more like half a ring, actually, because I guess mom instantly declined the call. Even though the sound stopped, I could tell that it came from the attic. 
That was the only place I hadn't checked. I ran up the stairs, my heart pounding. Mom, I shouted. Are you in here? Once again, she didn't answer, but I could clearly hear movement on the other side of the attic door. With a deep breath, I pulled the door open and saw that I wasn't home at all. My mother, along with six other people, sat in a circle on the wooden floor. They wore hooded robes, so I couldn't tell if any of the faces were recognizable, but I knew my mother. She sat furthest from the door, and she looked right at me. There was a large red symbol drawn on the floorboards between them. It looked similar to the markings I'd seen on the walls, with a perfect circle surrounding a series of curved and scratchy lines. Mom, I choked out. What's going on? She smiled, but it wasn't the smile I remembered. It was cold, blank. I'm so glad you came, she said. These are my new brothers and sisters. Have you come to join us? This woman was no longer the mother I had known and loved. She was something else, brainwashed by her new cult into something unrecognizable. Her hood hung low on her forehead, casting her face in a dark shadow. Behind her, I saw more of those strange jars that she kept in the kitchen. They each had the same chunks of meat, and I realized I had been wrong about them. They didn't hold animal organs. These were pieces of humans, of sacrifices. I screamed at my mom, telling her to please, this wasn't right. The strangers began to whisper to each other, but my mother silenced them all with a look. She then turned towards me. So why don't you want to join us? She asked, her voice blank. She didn't sound disappointed or surprised or anything at all. She snapped her fingers and the other figures stood in unison. They walked towards me, their dark robes rustling around as they moved stiffly. And before I could fight them off, they grabbed my arms and pulled me to the center of the room. They shoved me hard onto the floor, right on top of the dark red circle. Several candles shined along the corners of the attic, casting long shadows across everything. My mother laughed darkly, while the others stood along the outer ring of the symbol on the floor. My mother stepped inside the circle. She stood in front of me, both hands hidden behind her back. Suit yourself, she said. If you're not with us, then you can be an offering. As I screamed, my mother revealed both her hands and a long, twisted dagger that she was holding. She raised it over her head. Instead of driving it down, though, she stopped and said, Last chance. Okay, I screamed. I'll join you. Good, she answered, as if she expected me to say that all along. Come to mommy. I'll get you fitted for a new robe. My name is Billy, and I am 18 years old. I just finished high school. Hopefully, I will get into the university. I'm still waiting for the results. Although, for reasons that you will understand after I share this episode of my life, for the moment, that is not exactly the biggest of my concerns. I am the only son, and I live with my father, David. Just the two of us since I was five. That was the time when my mother, Sarah, left us. My father said she took off with some other guy that she was seeing. I used to ask about her until I became a teenager. I'm sorry, Billy, but I have no idea where your mother is. She simply called me one day and said she wasn't coming back. I won't lie to you, son, I wasn't exactly surprised. I had strong suspicions that she was seeing someone else, my father said. But didn't she want to stay in contact with me, I asked? I guess not. She didn't leave a phone number, an address, anything. And she never came by to visit you. And we still live at the same place. Your mother probably has her own family by now. 
I'm sorry, Billy. I know it's tough and hard to be rejected like that, but sometimes that's how life works. Most people in this world are selfish. I guess it's only natural that some of them end up being our closest relatives and friends. But I am always there for you and would never let you down. I would never impose a stepmother on you. That can be tricky and might not end up well for you, my father replied. I know, Dad, and I'm grateful. I love you. I love you too, son. And this was probably the last conversation that we had about my mother. My father was the best, not only a provider, but also a good friend. We always did tons of things together, like playing baseball, going to the movies, playing video games. In all honesty, I couldn't complain. But I guess it's a natural thing, a biological imperative, to want to stay in touch with your mother, knowing that she is alive out there. But some things aren't meant to be. As I grew older, my dad started to date more often. I guess he was already thinking ahead. Sooner or later, you're going to leave the house, Billy. Whether I like it or not, that's the natural course of things. And it's fine and healthy. You should be happy on your own, building your own life as an adult. And we will always be close, son, my father said. And of course, he was right. Some months ago during summer, I was home alone for about two weeks. I had never had that much time by myself, but my father was on vacation and he was going to Europe with his girlfriend. She was a nice woman, Samantha. Be responsible, Billy. You can have fun and friends and girls over, but don't let things get out of control, my dad instructed. No problem, you don't need to worry. Have a good time yourself, dad. Tell Samantha I said hi. Will do. See you in two weeks, son. My father hugged me before he left the house and got into his car. During the first couple of days, I did have some friends over, and we had a few beers and had good fun. But growing up as an only child, and since I didn't have a girlfriend, I decided to enjoy the rest of my vacation by myself. In a way, I guess I also wanted to have a taste of how it felt living alone. Something unexpected was about to happen, though. One night, I had a terrible nightmare. I dreamed about my mother. She was being killed, violently. She was screaming, completely helpless. I couldn't see the aggressor. He or she was just a black, shadowy figure. I woke up soaked in sweat. Eh, not exactly the best way to remember your mother. Maybe this is my subconscious telling me that my mother just got murdered, out there, wherever she is, I thought to myself as I got out of the bed. This was a painful and traumatizing scenario, but what could I do? The surprises were just about to begin, though, as I saw that the living room was filled with old pictures. They were spread throughout the floor, and they were all from my mother. She was either alone in those pictures or with me. I didn't see those in years. My hands trembled as I picked them all up. Who or what could have done such a thing? Some kind of bad joke? But why? I checked the locks, both from the doors and the windows. Everything was as it should be, so no one could have entered the house. The idea that this could be some kind of paranormal warning was growing stronger in my head. I wanted to call my dad, but on the other hand, I didn't want him to think that I was still an insecure little boy. And what could he possibly do anyway? That night, I had another dream, again about my mother. This time, she was speaking to me. She said, Look into the attic, my son, behind the old closet. Tear down that wall, and you will know. It's time for you to know. I woke up with those words in my head. I ran to the attic and followed my mother's indications. I removed the old closet and, with a hammer, I started to tear down the wall. After a few minutes, I screamed when I saw what was hidden there. A skeleton in female clothes. I remembered that, in one of her pictures, my mother was wearing those exact same clothes. I was in tears, but I had to face the truth. My mother was dead, and her remnants were right in front of me, and there could be only one possible explanation, and one suspect. I called the police. They took the skeleton with them. After DNA testing, it was confirmed. She was, in fact, my mother. The police waited for my father to arrive from his vacation, and they instructed me not to tell anything to him, on the phone, about what had been discovered. 
I felt bad, but I understood. After my father returned, the authorities interrogated him, taking him into custody. It didn't take too long for my father to break his silence. He confessed. My mother was, in fact, having an affair with someone else, but she never wanted to leave me. She wanted to leave my father and wanted to take me with her. My father couldn't bear the idea of being abandoned, losing both his wife and his son. And so, one night, he murdered my mother as I was sleeping. Then, he hid her corpse inside that wall. My father is in jail now, and he will never leave. It's an awful thing what he did. On the other hand, he was always a good father, and so I still visit him every now and then in the jail. But I also visit my therapist, because these are a lot of emotional contradictions for me to deal with by myself. Are you sure you'll be all right on your own? My mom asked for the fifth time that night, standing at the doorway with her purse clutched in her hands. The taxi was waiting on the street behind her, the bright headlamps cutting through the gloom of dusk. Mom, I told you I'll be fine. I'm 16 now, old enough to be home alone, I reminded her. Now hurry up or you'll be late for your date. She nodded, hesitating once more. I won't be more than a couple of hours. Call me if you need anything, okay? I've left my number in the kitchen next to the phone. I nodded, ushering her out into the chilly night. Have a nice time. Don't worry about me, okay? I love you, she said, pausing to kiss me on the head before climbing into the back of the taxi. I waved at her until the car pulled away, the bright lights disappearing around the corner. Then I closed the door, making sure to engage the lock. We lived in a pretty safe neighborhood, but my mom had always been obsessive about locking the doors and keeping the porch light switched on to deter potential thieves. The house was quiet now that it was just me, not that it was normally loud. It had been just my mom and myself for the past five years since my dad passed away. Tonight was the first time she'd gone on a date with another guy since then, after I'd begged her to give it a shot. I hated seeing her lonely, and while I missed my dad, I wanted her to be happy too. It was just after seven o'clock and I'd already eaten dinner, so I headed into the sitting room and collapsed on the sofa, looking for something to watch. An hour or so passed, and I was starting to get sleepy. I curled up on the couch, turning the volume down, and was about to fall into a deep slumber when the television suddenly switched off. The room fell into complete darkness, nothing but the faint glow of the moon shining through the window. I sat up, my heart in my throat, and realized that all the lights were off too. A power out? I scrambled off the sofa, trying the light switch, but nothing happened. It must have been a power outage, but when I glanced out the window, all of the other houses on the street were still lit. Was it just our house? That was weird. Waiting for my eyes to adjust to the sudden gloom, I stumbled blindly into the kitchen and began rummaging through the drawers for a torch. I'd grown out of my fear of the dark a long time ago, but there was still something unsettling about it, and I'd rather have at least something to see by. I found the flashlight and switched it on, shining it around me. The house was disconcerting in the dark. It didn't feel right, somehow. Power outs normally didn't last too long, so I figured I'd be okay if I just waited it out. I went back to the living room and sat down, keeping the flashlight on at my feet. Someone knocked on the door then, sending my heart into a frenzy. It was a heavy, impatient knock, one that shook the whole door frame. My first thought was that maybe it was one of the neighbors coming to check if I was okay after seeing the lights go out. They were all pretty friendly on my street, so it was plausible. I knew my mom wouldn't be happy about me answering the door while I was home alone, but I went to answer it anyway. I left the chain latched as I opened the door and peered out into the street. There was nobody there. Had I taken too long? Maybe it wasn't a neighbor after all. I quickly closed the door again and locked it, wishing that the lights would hurry up and come back on. Swallowing back the lump in my throat, I turned and headed back towards the living room. I took no more than three steps before I froze, the breath escaping from my lungs. Someone was standing outside the living room, peering in through the glass. I staggered back, switching off the torch so that they wouldn't see the light. Who was that? What were they doing? Was that who had knocked on the door? 
It was hard to see in the dark, but it didn't look like any of my neighbors. It was a man, older than my mom, wearing a dark coat. But that's all I could make out. I stood half hidden in the dark, hardly daring to breathe, until the man stepped back from the window and went back around the house. He was heading towards the back door. Was he going to break in? Panic flared in my chest, and I ran back into the kitchen, reaching for the phone. The moment I put it to my ear and heard silence, I knew it was futile. But surely the power wouldn't affect the phone lines as well. I tried dialing my mom's number anyway, but there was nothing on the other end. I wished more than anything that I had a cell phone then. All of my friends had one at school, but my mom had insisted on waiting until I was at least 18 before I had one as well. What was I supposed to do? The power was out, the phone wasn't working, and now there was a strange man hanging around outside the house. I can make a dash for one of my neighbor's houses, but that would leave the house completely unguarded. He might break in and steal something. Or worse, what if he caught me before I could make it to the neighbor's door? Would he hurt me? My thoughts were interrupted as bright yellow lights flooded the front of the house, and I ran towards the window. Those looked like car lights. A taxi had just pulled up on the street outside, and my mom was climbing out the back seat. I threw open the front door and ran to her before she'd barely made it a few steps up the drive. Mom, I'm so glad you came back, I blurted, the words falling out of me in a rush. The power went out and there's this strange man outside and the phone wouldn't work and I didn't know what to do and... Don't worry, sweetie, she soothed, rubbing my hair. You're all right now, I'm home. After I'd explained what had happened, we ended up staying at a neighbor's house while the police searched for the stranger, but they were unable to find any trace of him except for a few trampled flowers and muddy footprints. They did, however, find that the power lines to our house had been cut by force, which would explain why it was only our house that had no power or phone line. It was clear our house had been targeted for some reason. I'm just glad my mom came home when she did.